Okay, so um, module two um, is about uh, the data. So uh, you have seen with, um, with Mike what you will do at the end of uh, the day when you receive the data, when you have generated your, uh, your variant call and you want to, to find clinical aspect of the, of the, of the work. So um, in order to really understand what you will have in hand at the end of the, of the day, it's really important to understand how the data is generated and processed. So it's what we will see um, in that module and in the lab uh, afterwards. So what are the objectives? I will give you a short uh, introduction to um, how, what type of resource we use to do uh, computing of this of, uh, genomics data, to understand the, the kind of data we, we, will, we will use uh, in genomics, and to understand how we analyze them, to how we, uh, we map this um, read on the, this data on the genomes, and what type of why is it, what are the type of error you could face when you do this type of analysis, and you will, will also learn about terminology and uh, format. And in the lab, we'll do as a first step of uh, data processing. So first, a uh, small uh, introduction on uh, high-performance computing. So uh, when, you, when we work in genomics, uh, we cannot use traditional uh, computer, like your own laptop or your own personal computer. So what we need, we need to have high-performance computer, uh, which are called clusters, and in, it's a really a kind of a pool of uh, hundred or thousand of different computers together you could, you could use to, to, to do your analysis. Uh, why we need that is because the size of the data is really big and uh, the throughput of the data that is generated uh, all over uh, the world and especially here uh, in Canada is really increasing every, every year. So uh, building this high performance com uh, compu uh, high performance uh, computer is really costly, so um, you don't need to, to do that uh, because there is an initiative in Canada, which is called Compute Canada, which uh, build all this uh, high performance computer server uh, in uh, all over Canada. So uh, in every uh, province, you can find at least one or several um, server, uh, and uh, you can use the one of your province or the one of other uh, provinces. Uh, so the idea of uh, Compute Canada and of this server is to you ask for um, uh, an account, and if you are a Canadian academia, a Canadian researcher, you will have access uh, freely to this um, to this um, resources. So you ask for an account, they give you an access, then you will have uh, an allocation every year, which means allocation you will have a compute time, so number of uh, core you can use for another given of time and you have a storage space. So each time you log and you start to do some jobs, you will use your uh, compute time allocation and each time you generate a file and you put the file on disk, you will use your storage space. So it's really a um, simple way. Um, how you can get an account? Uh, I will not give you detail, but you need to go and you have the style, you need to go to Compute Canada to apply and then you, know, you, you go to the consortium uh, so to the province uh, consortium, provincial consortium, and you apply for a specific account in a specific cluster. Once you have your account, uh, you can uh, now log and do your analysis. Uh, what is important, and when you do your analysis, uh, because usually you don't want you want to have your your results as fast as possible, is uh, the, the, the important thing is the queuing time. Uh, Sometime. Being on queue, because a lot of people are using this resource, it's a shared resource, so being on queue could take, uh, could use more, most of your time than the real analysis. So you have some parameter you need to play when you do, uh, when you set up your jobs, is to um, what, the, what are the length of the job, what are the number of, of CPU you need, and how you have already used your allocation. So this is parameter you can use to try to avoid uh, spending so much time in queue. Also, how busy is the server? You cannot control, but if the server almost full, you will have to wait some time. Um, so we have these um, uh, resources available through Compute Canada, uh, and we will use uh, this resource during the, the, the practical after, after my talk. Um, but uh, what is interesting is that when you do genomic analysis, you don't want, you want to use this resource, but you want to have access to all the software that people are using, 
and all the other resources. So, in partnership with um, uh, Compute Canada, uh, the C2G have built um, um, a system based on the CMFS, so it's a uh, CERN virtual machine file system, which is a way to provide to every uh, HPC site uh, a set of resources. So the idea is we uh, take care of installing and, ma and maintaining the resources in one location and then every uh, site will have the same uh, resources available. So you, you could use a cluster in, uh, on, in Ontario, in British Columbia, or in Quebec, you will have access to the same software, to the same um, data set in terms of uh, genome references and, and so on. So uh, we do that uh, through um, an initiative which we have called GenPipes, uh, where we provide so the bioinformatics tools. Uh, so we provide more than uh, 90 different, uh, different tools for genomics. We provide uh, genomic resources, uh, so uh, 20 build for uh, 14 spaces. Uh, and we also provide um, Ketern analysis pipeline, where you can just use the pipeline and you will see what, what we'll do today is part of the beginning of the, one of the pipeline, which is the NASIC pipeline, but we have pipeline for cancer, for RNA-seq, for uh, uh, ChIP-seq, for uh, methyl-seq, metagenomics, so all these kind of things are already uh, set up for you if you, if you want to, to use it and do your, and analyze your, your data. So it's a really, really um, uh, a big effort that we have uh, done in partnership with Compute Canada, so, and it's free, so feel free to, to use it. Main issue, if you are not Canadian, uh, you may not be able to use it, so if you are not Canadian, uh, you could consider to become Canadian, but it's not so easy. Uh, but other thing is that uh, all this aspect of edge performance computing also um, could be uh, applied to other type of, um, of uh, resources like cloud computing. So uh, if you're not Canadian and you, you can want to use Amazon, things could be, um, uh, the analysis could be done the same way. And we are now working on a, a version of GenPipe uh, in a container that you can directly use in this type of um, resource like cloud computing, where you will have access to the same type of resource in terms of software and, um, and um, genomic resources. Okay, so now we, you, we have a better idea of how, where we, do, we should do this analysis. It's what the data and what the analysis we will, we will, we will do for in um, genomics and in specific when you want to do, um, uh, to generate variant. Uh, so, uh, what's the data? Um, so, most of you should know about Sanger sequencing and the usual traditional sequencing methods. So, uh, here we talk about high throughput data, so next generation sequencing data. And it's a, um, um, not uh, a clone based data as we did previously, but it's a, a cluster data. So, what the main difference is that instead of you are generating uh, 100 of sequence at a time, we generate now 100 of millions of sequence at at a time, so it's a, another scale of analysis. So all of this is based on what we call for small read bridge amplification. So when you do your uh, library prep, you take your DNA fragment, you share it in a small uh, pieces of a given lens that you have choose, and all these pieces you put it on the you put adapter at, at the two ends of the of the of your fragment, and you put that on the floor cell of uh, of the sequencer, and then you will do amplification. So the probes at the end of the fragment will fix uh, um, uh, probes on the flow cell, and the second probe will fix another probes, and you will create a bridge, and then you will have an amplification of your, of your sequence, and then you will have a two, uh, a two uh, strand structures after the first amplification. You will relapse into single strand structures, and you will do the same again and again to generate a, pool, uh, a, 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 a white a range of copy of your initial fragment. So at the end of your flow cell, you will end up with as a type of, um, of uh, profile where you will have uh, a lot of clusters uh, that show that, that represent the same initial fragment you have put in, in the flow cell. The sequencing will start. It will start from the, from the uh, top of your sequence. And at each cycle, each, uh, each uh, fragment will have an, uh, a, a base which is labeled with a fluorescent that will be had to do the, the sequencing. So at each cycle, the machine will take a picture, like, the, like this one, so it's a small part of the picture, and each of the cluster will uh, generate a dot on the, on the, on the, on the picture. So, and it will correspond to 
one base. So, uh, so for the oops, so the, for the first cycle here you will have a picture, another for the second, three, four, five, and you will be able to generate the corresponding sequence uh, for your um, for your fragment. So if we take that cluster, we'll have yellow, blue, green, yellow, uh, red, and it will be G T G C T G A. Okay, everybody understand that? So how? We do that for every cluster at the, at the time, for million, hundreds of millions of clusters at the time, and we are able to generate each uh, basis of each fragment for, for all the, the DNA fragments that have been put on the flow cell. So that's what the sequencer will output. So based on that, what, we, what we'll do, we'll take this and we'll process in order to generate uh, variant calls, so to generate what are the, speci uh, the, the specificity of each of your samples. Okay, so in that module, we'll only um, see how we can start from the data we've got from the sequencer to what we call a BAM file, so it's an alignment file, so a high-quality uh, file that you can use to do variant coding. So this is a full part line, so in this module, we'll just focus on that part, which could be a, a represent like that. So we'll have the FASTQ file from the sequencer, and we want to generate alignment-ready uh, file to do variant coding. So and so variant call and what we do from the variant will be uh, presented this afternoon in the module tree. So when I see a uh, FASTQ file, when I talk about FASTQ file, it's what you receive usually from your center. So you will either receive one or two files per sample, depending on the design of your, of your sequencing, but whatever the number of files you will receive, the format will be the same. So for each sequence, you will have four lines. The first one is the header that represents the name of the, of the sequence and some positional information followed by the line where you have the uh, real sequence itself here. Then you have a second header, so depending on which technology you are using, but uh, it will have either a second header or just a plus sign, in the middle it's a plus sign. And then you will have a second set of um, a sequence, which is the base quality sequence. So it's a score that is encoded as an ASCII characters that tell what the quality of each call that have been made for this sequence. Uh, so. How it works, you take this uh, character, you translate it into uh, numbers uh, with the ASCII code, and then this number gives you uh, um, um, a probability of error. So it's what we call the base quality. So what, what does that mean? So the base quality, the, the, the number you have there, is a thread score. A thread score means minus 10 log base 10 of uh, um, probability. And the probability in the case of base quality is the probability that you wrongly call uh, the base. So, for example, if, if we have a base quality of 20, we have 1% one, 1 chance that the, the base we called for this sequence is wrong. So the, more, the higher the score is, the better you, you can trust, the better is your, is your base called, and, and you, can trust, uh, you can trust it. So usually what we receive the data, we do a lot of QC. One of the main important QC is to look at your base quality all around your sequence. This is a type of graph. Uh, we generate where each box is represent one, one cycle, so all the first base of all read for that uh, run, and you have the distribution of base quality for that uh, cycle. So each cycle, first cycle, two cycle, third cycle, and so on until the end of your reads. So it's really important to look at that because uh, having high quality is really important. If you have low quality, it will bias. Uh, the mapping, it will bias uh, the SNP calling and then all the other subsequent um, analysis you will do. So when we have this data, usually what we are doing, we have a look at the FASTQ. Usually we saw this pattern with decrease of uh, quality at the end of, of, the, of, the, of the read. It's a normal pattern. Uh, so what we do, we usually trim the data. So what we, what we mean by trimming, uh, we filter read or part of the read that we don't want to keep in our analysis. So part of the read could be either we filter, so if we have reads that are uh, fragments that are short, we will we'll have the uh, sequence, the, your fragment, but at the end, we will start to, to sequence the adapter. So this is uh, the sequence we add uh, for the sequencing. So this is technical sequence. So there's no genomic sequence. You don't want to, uh, to have that in your analysis. So if we find them, we will remove from, you, from the sequence. Also, as we say, if the quality is not good, we'll start from the end of the, of the read and check for quality. So you, the user will define which uh, a given threshold, and if we saw base under this threshold in terms of quality, we remove the bases. So at the end, you will, uh, you will end up with reads with 
different sizes. And what we do, we only keep uh, reads that are uh, longer than a given uh, length, because otherwise, too short, the short read will not be um, really informative and, and may uh, create some bias in your, in your analysis. So it's the step of trimming. So after the trimming, what we, what we, we can consider that what we have generated is the, more, the most high quality uh, sequence. Now we want to do the alignment. So what the alignment means is to find the best location of your sequence on your reference genomes. I say best because as the reference is not complete, uh, it may not be the real uh, sequence. So you, you really want to find the, 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 best, uh, the best location. It seems to be it seems easier to do that, but it's not so, so easy because uh, first you need to do that for millions of, um, of sequence. Uh, and you need to find a location in a space that are billions of letters, so it's not as easy. Uh, you cannot use a traditional algorithm like BLAST, otherwise you will launch your analysis and you will come three months later, will maybe finish or not. Uh, so we want something fast and uh, accurate. And the issue is that some sequence will have many locations, so you will need to, 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 to find which one is the, is the real one or the best one. And you cannot only say, I want perfect matches, because the interest of the analysis is to find what is specific to your samples. So you want to tolerate uh, not exact match to be able to catch the biological variation in your specific sample. But when you do that, you also let errors and technicality become part of the play. So it's, you need to do not exact matching, but you will need after that to, to correct for possible uh, error. So to do that, we use uh, an algorithm which is called Brule Wheeler Transformer. I will not explain it today, but it's the one that is not used by most of the mapper. And we'll use the BWA um, uh, mapper, which is one of the best mapper um, that, are done, that are available for DNA-seq. Uh, if you use other type of data, of data RNA or, 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 or chip, or, you should use probably another uh, uh, mapper. When we do um, the, map, the mapping, it's uh, really important uh, to, so when we do DNA, usually it's uh, quite, uh, it, it, it happens quite often that we do several runs of sequencing for one sample. So in that case, each run of sequencing should be aligned individually and then merge all together. So when you do that, uh, you need to put a tag on each uh, run of sequencing to be able to identify your read at the end. Because if you see something particular in your, uh, in your um, sample at the end of your analysis, you will be interested to go back and to see if this pattern is shared between all your experiments, or if it's something that happened in only one, one experiment. In that case, it might be a batch effect or something like that. So it's really important to do that in order to decipher your signal, but also because a lot of tools that, you, that we use need to have these uh, tags on the, on the data. So when we do the alignment, we generate a file I call an alignment, an alignment file, either a SAM or a BAM. So the SAM is a text file, uh, the BAM is a binary compressed file. So now most of uh, most of tool use only uh, BAMs because it's uh, a, it's a, a way uh, um, smaller in terms of space on your on your disk. And what's the format of this file? So for each a sequence, you will have one line this time. The line will be like that. You will have the first column, which will be the, the name of your read, the same as in the FASTQ. You will have a score here, a flag that tells information about how the, the, the sequence, uh, the, the, the fragment have been, have been mapped. Uh, so uh, compared to his mate, compared to the strand, compared to all of this kind of information, we will see it uh, more in detail during the practical. Then you have the position here, where uh, the, the sequence have been uh, um, located. So the, the chromosome, the position on the chromosome, you have the score of your alignment. So it's a, it's a thread score that tells you the quality of your alignment. You have a cigar string, which tells you information about how your uh, fragment have been uh, matched to the reference. So it's really a, a kind of physical matching uh, description. And then if you have a paired and read, so if you have two, the two ends of your uh, fragment that have been sequenced for the same fragment, you, so that you have the mate uh, information in terms of position and the inside side. 
then you have the sequence in terms of bases, the, self, the sequence in terms of base quality, and usually you've got extra flags that I will not describe here because these flags are really aligner dependent. So each aligner will generate its own flag. So when we have done that, we have generated the alignment. But um, alignment is a complex process. And um, when you do that, uh, the aligner needs to choose some parameters like penalties and, and so on. So it's not a perfect job that it has been done. There's no aligner that will do a perfect job. So uh, what we need to do is to take this alignment and to refine it to, give, to have the, the high quality uh, alignment alignment file before doing the variant calling. So I will, uh, how we will refine um, the alignment? The first thing we will do is to do indel realignment. So why we need to do that is because most of the aligner uh, tend to favor to create mismatch between um, the sequence, the reference sequence, and, the, and the, the, the read sequence instead of creating gaps. So if you are in a region where you have indels, uh, you will uh, quite often see this kind of patterns where you will accumulate mismatches on your reads uh, in a really close proximity. So we know that uh, we don't expect to see variants quite often in the genome, around uh, one variant every, uh, every, ki every uh, kilo basis, depending on the region, it could be less or, or more, but you don't expect to see like five or six variants in 100 bases. So what indel element will do, it will uh, look, at your, um, you look at your fragment, and uh, look at your reads on the genomes, they identify in the first place region where you think there may be an indel that have not been called, and then it will go back to this region, retake all the reads that are mapped on that uh, region, and try to insert indel to see if that, if that can improve the mapping. If it, if it sees that it don't have improved the mapping, it will let the, the read the, the same way. If you think that the, the indel could improve, it will re, um, realign uh, the, um, the read. Like that. So in that case, in that region, you see that adding the IDL make almost all the uh, all the variants uh, disappear. So probably all these variants were uh, technical artifacts, so were false positive if we don't have the IDL realignment. Another type of um, refinement we want to do on uh, the data is to mark or remove duplicates. So what are duplicates? Is duplicates is uh, when you do your sequencing, you have your DNA fragment at the beginning. And what you want, your goal, is to have one sequence per initial DNA fragment you have generated at uh, the library prep. Uh, but due to the way the library are uh, generating, you could have several uh, um, sequences that represent the same initial fragment. So you don't want to count that fragment uh, several times. Because if there's an error at the beginning, then you will see these errors that pop up in several fragments, and you will see, oh, probably that it's a variant. No, it's just an error that you see several times. So you, you really want to see uh, only one um, copy. So where does this uh, duplicate come from? It could come from in all Illumina flow cell. It could come from um, if you have large, really large cluster, it could take this large cluster and, and consider it as one of several clusters, at several clusters, two, three, four, five clusters. So it will generate several copies of the same uh, data. In the new flow cell, Illumina flow cell, where all the clusters are already defined, if you have empty cluster, sequence can jump from one to the other cluster. It could come from PCR. So if you do a lot of PCR cycle, it could generate many copies of your data. So it's why now all, many of the, of the library kit uh, that we use are called PCR-free to, uh, to, to, to remove all the PCR uh, steps in order to remove the duplicates. Or it could be sister, so cam chimeric sequence that generate because of, um, of two sequences in the flow cell that merge together, and that will uh, propagate around a free cluster. So there are different ways to uh, detect them. Uh, and here we will uh, look at the two different approaches during the practical. So it's really important to remove that uh, because otherwise I say it could create um, false positive in your data. As I say previously, the base quality is really important uh, when, we do, uh, when we do variant coding, it's used, the variant coding, it's usually based on um, a Bayesian approach, which takes different type of uh, parameters in the, in the model, and one of the, one of the parameters is the base quality of the, uh, of your, of the, at this location, of the, of the sequence at this location. Uh, so what we want, you want to have the, the real uh, and the more accurate uh, base quality. And uh, it has been shown uh, that the vendor, the sequencer, try to inflate 
the base the base that are generated by the by the machine to say oh we are good, and especially that this machine suffer from specific um, um, uh, sp specific uh, bias uh, related to the uh, genomic uh, context. For example, which bases are you sequencing one after the other? Or by the by the position of your read, by the position of the bases in your read. So the idea of the base recalibration is to take all your alignment, to look at this known pattern of error, to model it, and then to correct for it to have a higher, a better representation of your quality. So when we have done that, we have a variant calling ready uh, alignment. So we are ready to do variant calling. But what is important to do also all along the process is to generate matrix. Uh, really, matrix is really, really important. At each step of your analysis, you need to generate matrix. Uh, why? Because uh, if you have any issue at the end of your, of your um, analysis, by looking at the matrix you have generated, you will be able to understand where the error comes from and what's happening in, in, your, in your analysis. Otherwise, you will have to restart one by one and see and check what I, what I've been done. So metrics is really important. So there's plenty of tools that provide metrics, uh, and we'll see we'll generate it during the, the, the practical. Um, if I have to pick up some of the metrics, uh, the four important will be looking at trimming, looking at alignment. So uh, trimming, as I say, the, the graph that we show alignment, alignment rate, uh, to understand if we are correctly aligning your read, if we are if we are using the good references. Also, depth of coverage, because usually you target a, a given depth of coverage with your genomic center. You want, for example, 30x, or you want 100 if you do exams. And you want to be sure that you receive what you have asked for. Um, and also, inter size. So when you do med pair, it's important to have to control for the size of your fragment, because for uh, if you want to do structural variant calling, as <coughs> inter size is really important in the, in the, in the detection of structural variant. Okay, so. Yes. Yes, I can comment on that. Uh, so, um, now that we um, saw that um, many sequencer, uh, so uh, first the question was, is the trimming uh, optional now or not? Um, so. Um, if you have really high quality data with really best quality, uh, you could not you could not do the trimming part. If you use Mapper that support um, what we call um, uh, the soft clip. So the soft clip is if you find a sequence that is not in the, in the genomes, it will mark this part of the sequence of your reads and take it. This is not part of the genomes like adapters. It will mark them directly on the read and it. So you won't, you won't need to remove it at the beginning of the trimming. So it's true that now, if you have really good quality, you can skip this part. But uh, not all the mapper support that. So that's why we'll show, well, I will show it. But if you have BWA support it. So if you have really good quality, every all the base quality is, is on, on the roof, on top of the, on the roof, and you have really small level of uh, adapter, you could go without trimming. OK. So, in conclusion, uh, if you want to do that, so uh, if you want to do data processing, uh, you just need to warn you that you will need a lot of mathematical and informatic skills to do that. Um, if you don't want to do it, you will probably find by informatician to do, to do it for you. Uh, but it's important that you understand what uh, they are doing on your data, because each time we do analysis, we make choice. And if we make a choice, uh, there is a cost to pay. I mean, a cost. I mean, you have a counterpart that of, of your of your choice, and you need to understand the choice that have been made and what that means in at the end on your on your samples. So because some variant could be uh, missing because of this choice, some some pattern should be should pop up due to this choice. So you need to understand exactly how your data have been uh, generated. My main message is also metrics, metrics, metrics. That's really really important. Uh, if I want to, to, to summarize also, uh, try to always generate the best quality data at each step before going to the next steps. Um, and uh, this is a general comment. 
the major challenge now for doing this data processing um, is not the methodology, because now a lot of methodology are, are, are really there, except for really new type of analysis, but for general processing, all the methodology is there, all the tools are there, which is more um, challenging now is the compute resources and the storage capacity. So it's why I had this introduction on, on Compute Canada, because uh, this really, uh, you, you will have, like, you will need, like, a lot of uh, CPU to, to do the analysis, and uh, if you do whole genome sequencing, uh, one sample uh, could take uh, more than a terabyte during the processing per sample. So if you have uh, 100 of sample, you need to have 100 of terabyte of space. So it's good. It's really uh, challenging. Okay, so that's it. Do you have any question? Um, yeah. In the metrics, is yeah. there one problem that is more common than the other, and what is would be the, the fix for it? There are so many problems <laughs> you can face. Up. Um, one um, one problem that um, we ca you can see, for example, which is really easy, and is for example, um, you don't choose the right um, the right reference genomes. So here it's common because most of us will work on human, so we have the, the, the right one. But if you then want to work on mouse, or if you think you will work with human sample, and then you align your genomes, and you see that your alignment rate is low, uh, it should be OK. Probably I don't use, or probably there's a, a mix up on the, on the data. Um, but even in human, a lot of times, as we've discussed before, the actual assembly, so if you map one data set on one assembly, and then you use a different data set that was mapped using a different human assembly, and that's a very common mistake. Yeah, for long-term projects where we have some projects that start years ago where the, the last build was not the same, so it uh, could be an issue. So I would not say that um, there's one matrix you can use, but what uh, the, the main important thing you need to do, and it's related to what Guillaume is saying, is to harmonize your analysis all along your um, project. So, because if you change, if you run, for example, 10 samples on one pipeline, and then you say, oh, this new pipeline arrives, this new assembler, this new variant color, and then you use the other in a new, with a new pipeline, you will create, create technical artifacts. And you will create this kind of batch effect that then you can, um, you can um, perhaps uh, take as biological signals. So really, when you do a large project with several uh, samples, uh, try to use the same kits, try to use the same sequencing technologies, the same pipeline, the same everything should be harmonized. Otherwise, you will have, we know that each pipeline, each kit generate its own uh, false positives that you, you could uh, then interpret as a logical variant. Just, I would add, so I think the, the sequencers have been some metrics that really have to do with the sample itself, right? the quality of the sample, like duplicate rates, for instance. Right? So if you don't have a lot of material and the sample is amplified, so watching the duplicate rates is important, and marking duplicates yeah. as you're going to be doing is important. So that's one. But there's some, well, I mean, sometimes there's problem with the sequencing, but often there's problem with the sample itself. Right? Some of these metrics really have to do with the quality of the DNA that I would say one one of really important steps is also yeah, the base recalibration because it's one that removes a lot of false positives. And it's, uh, I think it's a pity because the tool that we use to do that, which is GATK, which is a broad tool, um, has no decrypted these tools because they have no generate um, variant colors that do it directly at the variant calling. Uh, but we we need to do it because we don't we use this tool for variant calling for for, for single nucleotide variant calling. But if you want to do uh, uh, structural variant or other type of analysis, uh, you don't have this. You, you need to have this data, this, this BAM file with this uh, indel re realign already done. So 
Yeah. For me, it's a really important part. And when I talk to people with uh, the GTK, I always say, why did you remove them? We're not using, we're on, there's not only your tools that can be used. So it's, uh, so I say that there's no one particular metric. It's really a, a set of metrics.